Let's come to the Lord in prayer before the message. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit who works in and through us to bring us ever closer to Christ Jesus. So as we come to your word this morning, oh, Lord God, fill us with the love of Christ. Lift us up. Convict and encourage us all according to your will and purpose, all for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week was Pentecost Sunday, right? Do you remember what Pentecost means? The number means 50. It was 50 days after Passover, after the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. So it was on that day that the Christian church was born. It was on that day that the Holy Spirit came with great power, with wind, fire, and tongues, speaking in tongues, so that the disciples were given the words, so that people would know of Jesus and hear the gospel message and come to saving faith. It was the Holy Spirit who lifted up, who empowered Peter to preach his sermon. And it was a sermon that first started off in the Old Testament. It was a sermon that started off with Joel and then focused on who Jesus is. Now, in a very broad terms, you could say that his sermon was Bible-based and Christ-centered without doubt. And that's really important because it is those two things that guide us. See, if anybody asks me, what is Joy Church? What's Joy Church about? I normally start off with telling them we are Bible-based and Christ-centered because it is those two things that are, so to speak, Jesus and his word that guide our ship, our journey of faith that keep us on course. If we don't have that, we will veer off course. But it is also then through the power of the Holy Spirit that fills our sail, that gives us movement along the way. So it is Jesus and his word, and then we are filled with the Holy Spirit. If without the Holy Spirit, we would have good doctrine, but we would be sitting still in the water without movement. And that's why we talk about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the same manner, no matter how good doctrine there is in a sermon, without the Holy Spirit working, there is no movement. So if you want a really good sermon, pray for the preacher to be filled with the Holy Spirit, but even more so, <laughs> but even more so, Pray for the listeners to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because you will hear preacher after preacher, there will sometimes be like, uh, you know, that wasn't very good. And then people will come up and say, oh, that was just for me. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. So we, that's why we pray for the Holy Spirit. Now, we left off last week, part one, with Peter's preaching, and verse 23 of Acts says, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. And Peter gets to the core, the crux of his whole message that Jesus rose from the grave. That Jesus rose from the grave. Because if Jesus did not raise, was raised from the grave, we would still be in our sins. We should still most be pitied. It would mean that Jesus was simply a deluded martyr. But in fact, God did raise him from the dead. And thus, we are in joy and in glory. 
Now, if you tell people that today, there are a lot of people who are skeptics and scoffers about Jesus rising from the dead, right? And also in Peter's crowd, in Peter's uh, group that he was preaching to, there were not only skeptics, there were scoffers. So he says, don't take my word for it. You can actually hear what Scripture has to say about this Jesus. And so we are going to continue in part two in our series, and we're going to start with the prophecy concerning Jesus. So Acts chapter 2, starting verse 25. For David, him, for David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh will also dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. So Peter starts off speaking about David. Now, people would know King David. David, who slew Goliath. David, the shepherd king. David, the king of Israel, whom God said from his line would come the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one who would save his people. Look, even if the crowd wasn't educated in Scripture, and probably many of them were not, just like today, a lot of people aren't educated in the Scripture, they would at least know King David. But Peter starts off, talking about King David and referring to Psalm 16. So if you want to, you can uh, cross references. Psalm 16, starting with verse 8. But D Peter says something different. He says that although David wrote this psalm, it's Jesus who is speaking. Even though David wrote it, this is Jesus who is speaking in the first person. See, the psalm's written in the first person, right? I saw the Lord always before me. Later on, you will not abandon my soul to Hades, to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. Look, if these were the words of David alone, they would be false because he did die. His body did decay. But this is the words of Christ Jesus speaking in Psalm 16. Uh, psalm 16. Now, we find this actually in a couple places throughout Scripture, that it's not just the psalmist, but it is Christ Jesus, the Lord God, speaking. For example, if you cross-reference Psalm 22, it's up on screen there, I would encourage you to cross-reference Psalm 22. It actually begins this way, a psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those words should sound pretty familiar, right? Where do we hear these words? We hear them when he was crucified. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These are the words of Christ written by David. And then later on in the Psalm 22, verse 18, it says, they divided my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. Did that happen? Yes, indeed, they cast lots for his clothing. So even though David wrote it, this is Christ Jesus and his words. So now let's go a little bit just to what Peter says. Psalm 16. I saw the Lord always before me, before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. In a literal manner, the presence of the Lord is always before my sight. God my Father is always before me. Never do I look away from him. That's what it's saying there. And then it says that God is at his right hand. I want you to just bookmark that a little bit because later on we're going to talk about what it means to be at the right hand of God. But here, God the Father is at the right hand of Jesus. What this is really talking about is the close relationship that the Father and Son are one together. 
They are not separated. It says this, Psalm 16 shows such a close relationship with Jesus and the Father that Jesus' whole being, his whole being is filled with joy and rejoicing even when he must endure the cross which is before him. Even in the cross that is before him, he is still filled with joy. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, Look into Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So David is quoting Psalm 16. He says, that joy is so complete. The relationship is so complete. The point is this that God the Father will never let his son see corruption. He will never let his body decay. Now, there's something else that goes on in here that goes by pretty fast. It also says, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. There's that phrase, Holy One, right? And it refers to Jesus, doesn't it? Jesus being the Holy One. But did you know that the Holy One is a title reserved for God? Again, in Psalm 89, it says, For our shield belongs to the Lord, Lord in all capitals, that means Yahweh, the Lord God, our King to the Holy One of Israel. The Holy One, God, it's associated the same thing. So even here, you can see that when Peter is quoting Psalm 16, it is a messianic psalm that has much depth and breadth. And he's saying what was foretold by David is now fulfilled in Christ Jesus. And Christ Jesus is God himself. This is the power of what happens when he quotes scripture. So with that, he can say with certainty that David was talking about the resurrection of Christ Jesus. Verse 29 through 31, you have just 31 up on the screen. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. So let me ask you a question. What's the one thing that if it was found would completely destroy Christianity? the bones of Jesus. If we found his grave and found his bones, and we could say with certainty that was the bones, those are the bones of Christ, our faith would be in vain. You take a look at all the great religious leaders throughout history, all the great philosophers, all the great kings and queens, even the kings, the queens of, of Egypt, right, that build the huge pyramids, the monuments to themselves, their bones are there, aren't they? But not with Christ Jesus. So Peter says, look, even though he's a witness to this, right? He's a witness to the resurrection of Christ Jesus Scripture also affirms that King David, whom you revere, also affirms that he has been resurrected. Because there's a promise, there's an oath that God made that from his line, from David's line, would come one of his descendants that would sit on a throne and his kingdom would have no end. Now, I've mentioned this before, but this, you should just start to know, where is that promise made? And that promise was made to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, starting with verse 12. So this is where you start to need to learn and bookmark your scripture. 
2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 and 13. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So there's a kingdom upon which one of the descendants of David will reign forever. Well, who is that? That's Christ Jesus. We need not look any further than the Gospel of Luke. What did Gabriel tell Mary? He said, he, your son, Jesus, he will be great and be called son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom. There will be no end. So Peter is saying, hey, David, David prophesied about Jesus and his resurrection. This is David, by the way, who lived a thousand years before Jesus. He had prophesied about it. And therefore, Peter says, with certainty, with confidence, he foresaw, David foresaw, and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, and that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. You see, Peter's saying, look, I'm an eyewitness here, and I have my testimony, but there is even more testimony than that. There is the testimony of Scripture. See, some of you I know have said, wow, pastor, you go back and forth all the time, back and forth in Scripture. And I do that because Scripture is so interrelated. And when you see the interrelatedness of Scripture, it gives you greater and greater confidence. Let me show you something here. This graph, this chart, was created by Chris Harrison, who is an assistant professor of human-computer interaction at Carnegie Mellon University, and Pastor Christopher Rum, Rumhild, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name. It is a visualization of 63,779 cross-references between the Old Testament and the New Testament. 63,779 cross-references. And there are some cross-references that start in Genesis and fulfill their arc in Revelation throughout. And so you see not only the complexity, but the interrelatedness of Scripture. Now, just out of curiosity, I thought, all right, if I did just five cross-references a day, it would take me over 34 years to do 63,779 cross-references. I mean, this is, this is why we take a look at Scripture, and we don't just stick with a text. We say, what does Scripture, and let Scripture interpret Scripture. What does Scripture say about itself? So, what we find here is the prophecy of Jesus and the certainty of his resurrection all point to Jesus as our ascended Savior, Lord and Savior. So let's talk about the ascension, the Lordship of Jesus. So, verse 32 through 36, you just have 34 on, through 36 on there. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out on this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself said, says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel know therefore for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Now remember, I asked you to bookmark something about the right hand of God, right? Before we saw that God, 
The Father was at the right hand of Jesus. Now Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. There are people, by the way, who will want to say, because of this, Jesus is lesser than God the Father. Well, there's God the Father, but Jesus is sitting at the right hand, so that's a lesser position than the throne itself, right? No. Don't let people sway you with that argument. Because actually, in the, both the Old and the New Testament, a person of high rank who put someone on his right hand gave him equal honor with himself and recognized him as possessing equal dignity and authority. This is why the Jews, also the Israelites, were incensed when Jesus was equating himself with God so that if he is at the right hand of God, it is of equal authority, equal dignity, equal glory. This is written in many places throughout Scripture about the, the glory of Christ Jesus. I'm going to mention a couple here. Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 19. According to the work of his mighty strength, which he worked in Christ in raising him from the dead, and he seated him, that's Jesus, God the Father seated Jesus at his right hand in the heavenlies, far above all principality and authority and power and dominion, and every name be named, not only in this world, but also in the coming age, the exaltation of Christ Jesus. I would encourage you also to take a look at uh, Philippians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 1, Revelations chapter 5. I know, I just gave you a couple of them. Look, I know, 63,779, there's your five for the day, right? But take a look at those, and you see the glory, the exaltation of Christ Jesus. He is above all things, and he is before all things. See, although Jesus became man and was in the flesh. He is fully man. He is fully divine. And this is what Peter, this is what Scripture, what God the Father, the Holy Spirit, the Son all affirm that Jesus is Lord. And that he is sitting at the right hand of God. His sitting means that his work of redemption is done. On the cross, he said, to Telestai, it is finished. And thus, he is sitting at the right hand of God, knowing that the full work of redemption is done. And on the last day, those who profess Christ as Lord and Savior are with him. And those who reject him are his enemies and they will be as a footstool to him. All of creation at the end will acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, either to their glory or to their condemnation. This is the, this is the sermon. This is the sermon that Peter preached, and what a sermon, a spirit-filled sermon. He says, all foretold by David, fulfilled in Christ Jesus, sealed by the Holy Spirit. Now, if you had heard such a sermon, you were there. What would you do? What would you be moved to do? And so the crowd really said, what shall we do? Verse 37, it says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, pierced to the heart, right? And Peter and the rest of the apostle, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. 
Peter's reply was immediate. Repent. What is this word repent? I mean, we use it, right? But what does this word actually repent mean? Repent is different, by the way, than just feeling bad about something. Repent is this, a change of mind, a change of the whole personality from a sinful course of action to God. I like how this sign has it. It's, it's the 180, right? Literally turning the opposite direction. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, he says, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. There are a lot of people who feel remorse. There are a lot of people who grieve without repentance. And that just leads to their death. I want to give you two examples. One of, I think, unrepentance and another of repentance. So uh, Heidi and I recently watched a documentary on Lance Armstrong. You know Lance Armstrong, right? Won the Tour de France seven times. Um, he was world renowned. His fame was throughout the world. He was also a cancer survivor, started a cancer foundation. He had the adulation of millions upon millions of people except it was based on a lie because he was taking performance enhancing drugs and doing other things. But when he was asked about it, he adamantly denied it again and again and again. Even when the truth came out, he denied it. And you know what he did? He literally attacked and destroyed people's character and their lives. It was vicious. And so in this documentary that we watch, it was very interesting. It was a two-part documentary, two, two plus hours or more. And at the end, Heidi and I looked and thought, he still doesn't get it. There was remorse at some points, but there was still a, a rebellion that he had. He had some grief, but he did not have repentance. And it looked like he was just going to go on doing the same thing. So I think that's one example of a grief that does not lead to repentance, that leads just to more death. But you remember, we had uh, some men come here from Arizona Adult and Teen Challenge, and they gave their testimony. And in their testimony, they talked about their life beforehand and it was bad, right? And they were doing nasty stuff. And there were lies and there were many things. But they came to the point where they hit rock bottom. And they actually repented and received Jesus as Lord and Savior. And because of that, their lives did a 180, didn't it? People don't even recognize them in to such a degree that their lives were so changed. You see, when there's actual conviction of sin and repentance and then receiving Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior, you are a new creation. Behold, all things are new. This is what happened on the day of Pentecost. People were born again. And so on that day, it says, and with many other words, he bore, this is Peter, and with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added uh, that day about 3,000 souls. What a sermon, right? What an outpouring of the gift of the Holy Spirit upon those people. That is the birth of the church. Bible-based, Christ-centered, filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit. If anybody asks you about our church, you can say those words. That's who we are. So 
your assignment. What about you, right? We always want to make sure we are applying this. So, if you are listening today, and I know there are people throughout the U.S. who are listening, if you are listening and you are not of faith, pray for the Holy Spirit to pierce your heart with the words of Christ, that you come to repentance and know Jesus as Lord and Savior. You often don't hear that, by the way, in calls to faith, right? Is your heart pierced with repentance? So, that's one. Immerse yourself in Scripture. We've talked about that. If you don't have a good study Bible, get one. It has all the cross-references in there, and you can start seeing the interrelatedness of Scripture, and your confidence in God and His Word and your salvation will grow. And finally, if you are of faith, pray for the Holy Spirit to bring you to an ever greater faith in our Lord and Savior. This is the day of Pentecost. This is the church. This is who we are in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift you have given us in Christ Jesus that you have poured out on us through the Holy Spirit. Encourage us. Give us ever greater faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We hope that you've been blessed by this message. If you have any questions or you would like to grow deeper in your faith, please visit our website at joyccc.com. Again, that's joyccc.com.